All right, so uh, everyone can see the screen. All right, so uh, is the screen visible for everyone? It's clear? Yes, sir. All right, okay, so we'll start um, before that. Um, I did uh, went through some of your quizzes. Um, I did not get enough time to check all of them as I was also, uh, I also gave quizzes to O levels and AS students. So I'll, I'll check them by the end of this week, right? And uh, then I'll share uh, the, uh, all of your quizzes back with all of you. And uh, then we can solve the quiz in the class as well, right? Uh, if, do, do you have any uh, other questions regarding whatever we have done so far in this topic of ideal gases? Uh, is there any question? All right, so I'll assume that there is no question and Last time we were solving a problem. We, what we did last time, we talked about the relationship between the molecules speed and the pressure exerted. And we derived a relation for that, if you remember, right? So this is what we did. We derived a relation that relates pressure to the velocity of the molecule. Right? So we took one part, one molecule, and we solved that for this one molecule. And then we found a relation. Uh, we extended that to multiple molecules. Right, And so that's where this uh, mean value of the velocity squared came from. The next thing we, were, we, we started off was with a problem. And so I'll restate the problem. And so we can solve that. Uh, the problem is something like you have a, at, at a room temperature, which is 300 kelvins, and at room pressure, uh, you have 1.0 into 10 raised to power 5 pascals, right? So these are just room temperature and pressures. Uh, you have a mole of gas, and this mole of gas at room temperature and pressure occupies a volume of 24 decimeters cube. The task was to compute the root mean square velocity, right? So we'll have to compute, well, if you just compute this thing, which is the mean square of velocity, then you can just take the under root of that and then you'll get the root mean square velocity. Uh, so we have to compute this thing at this, temperature, right, which is the room temperature. Uh, we will do it for two different types of gases, which are made of uh, molecules. So we have helium gas, right? So this gas is made up of helium atoms and which have a, an atomic mass of four times U, right? And then let's do it for oxygen. But you have to remember here that oxygen is a molecule, right? And so the atomic mass of oxygen molecule is 16 U, right? So I need the molecular mass of oxygen. So that would be two times 16, right? So that's 32 U. So that's the problem, right? So can anyone tell me how will I compute this uh, velocity? root mean square velocity. Note that we have pressures, we have temperature, and we have a volume that this gas is occupying at these pressure and temperatures, right? So anyone remembers anything that we did in the last lecture? So you can tell me, how will I go about this problem? By the way, is the statement of the problem clear to everyone?
the class has become really quiet after Eid holidays. Uh, anyone? Can anyone help me with solving this problem? All right, so I'll just give you a hint. Uh, I will just write that equation that we derived last time. Uh, that was P, which is pressure, was equal to one third times N M V squared root uh, the mean of V squared divided by the total volume, right? So that's the expression that we have. The task is to find out this thing. Uh, let me just color it in green. So what is the, this thing in green? So that's what we want to find out, right? So of course, we'll write this as V square is equal to three P times V divided by N times M. All right, so this is what we have now. Uh, we have pressure, right? We have pressure, we have volume, which is 24 decimeters cubed. Uh, what about this thing, N and M? Anyone? Okay, so N is are these uh, for helium gas, for example, let's do it for helium gas at first. So N is four uh, and we'll just multiply it with one mole of helium atom, right? So the total mass of helium atom is given by N times M, which would be what? Four times 10 raised to power minus uh, sorry, minus three kilograms, right? So are you getting, uh, where, how did I write this thing, NM? Because that's the only unknown uh, at this point. Um, I cannot hear you. Uh... No, could you go over this again? Yeah. All right, so, uh, yeah. Uh, we have this equation, right, for pressure and uh, velocity, right? So an equation that relates these two things. And that's this equation that we derived last time. So we just rearrange this equation for this expectation value of velocity squared. And that's this expression. The problem is we don't know, or at least you might think that we don't know N and M, right? Because P and V, we know they are pressure, uh, room pressure and volume is 24 decimeters cube, it's given. N and M, what is that? N times M is defined as the total mass of one mole of any atom, right? In this case, we are talking about helium atom, right? So N, M is the uh, total mass. N, M is just N multiplied by M, right? Uh, it's the total mass of one mole of atom sorry, uh, yeah, any atom, right? So one mole of any atom, you could say. So in this case, it is uh, helium because we are working this thing for helium. So, right. So that's where we have this four into 10 raised to power minus three kilograms because this is four times U, right? So U is just the atomic uh, unit, which if you uh, want the atomic, total atomic mass in kilograms, uh, U is just into one into 10 raised to power minus three. And so just four into 10 raised to power minus three kilograms is the uh, total mass of one mole of helium atom. So that's where I have this four into 10 raised to power minus three kilograms from. So the next step is very simple. You just put in the values three times pressure, which is given as 1.0 into 10 raised to power five pascals times volume, which is given as 24 decimeter cube, divided by this thing, Nm, which is four into 10 raised to power minus three kilograms. You do the math and you get a value, uh, which would be 1.8 into 10 raised to power, uh, we have three from here, five, minus three, and this is deci, so, so it would be six, right? Meters square per 
second square. So that's what? That's the expectation value of velocity squared, or you can say it's the mean of velocity squared. The question was to find the uh, root mean square value, right? So you, we normally write it as RMS, and the root mean square value for this thing is simply the square root of this thing, right? It's just the square root of this value, which would be the square root of 1.8 into 10 raised to power six. And well, you can work that out, right? So it's just the square root of this thing, right? And that's the answer for, uh, or you can say that this is the root mean squared. This is the average velocity with which the helium atoms will be moving if they were put in a container where uh, the uh, these conditions are met. 300 Kelvin is the temperature, and at 300 Kelvin, the, temp uh, the pressure is 1.0 into 10 raised to power five. So under these conditions, for example, if I were to lock the helium gas in this container, right? Here we have helium gas, and the temperature of this container is 300 kelvins. And at that temperature, the pressure is given as 1.0 into 10 raised to power five pascals, right? So if these were the conditions and this volume of this container is 24 decimeter cube, in that case, the every molecule uh, or every atom of helium gas in this container would be moving with the velocity, which is this thing. Right? So is that clear? Yes, sir. All right, okay. So the next part is for doing it for the oxygen uh, molecule. It's extremely simple. You'll follow exactly the same thing. Uh, I recommend, I'll share these notes with you after the class as well. And I recommend that you do this part B, uh, this one, uh, by yourself, right? Try it doing yourself. And if you have any problems, uh, we can discuss it in the next class, right? So uh, after the class, I'll share these notes with you as well. So you can go through these and see. All right, so with this, let's move on to the uh, next topic, which is the topic of relating temperature to the energy of these molecules namely the kinetic energy, right? So we want to relate temperature and kinetic energy, right? Okay, so really what happens is uh, temperature is like a velocity. We, we all are familiar with this expression for kinetic energy that it is given as half times mass times velocity squared, right? In general, whenever you're talking about mechanics, right? Simple classical Newtonian mechanics. The kinetic energy of any translational motion is given as this thing. Now, in thermodynamics or this matter physics, uh, the analog of this velocity is really the temperature. Now, what that means is, because we know if velocity, if I have a particle and it's moving with some velocity, right? Now, if this velocity is a higher number, then we know that the particle would be moving fast, right? If the velocity is a lower number, then we know that the particle would be moving slow compared to any value, right? Similarly, in thermodynamics, that thing is communicated to you via temperature, right? So for example, I can again consider a box and I have a molecule in this and I start apply some heat to this uh, container, right? What that does is that will heat up the walls of the container. And what is happening really is that the container is obviously made up of atoms as well. So when I heat the walls of this container, those atoms start jiggling, right? Jiggling is a, a very informal word. They start vibrating and so on, right? And that is because again, 
the heat or the when the temperature rises that is causing increasing the speed of these molecules and that will eventually if the if the internal uh, thing is conductive then it will eventually uh, the heat will travel to this molecule and what happens is then this molecule starts speeding up so that means that of course temperature and kinetic energy are closely related to each other right so how can i find a relation between temperature and kinetic energy so we can do that and it's very simple uh, what we want to do is really we want to find a relation between temperature and velocity of the molecule right so if we if you remember we have equation of state given as pv equals number of moles times r t right so we have talked about this equation in detail uh, this is the equation of state uh, for ideal gases right where we gave some conditions and if those conditions are met uh we derived uh, the relation now if i want uh if if i want a relation between temperature and velocity of the particle then i have already derived a relation of relating pressure with the velocity right we did that over here right this was this relation p is equal to 1 by 3 nm v expectation value of v square divided by the volume so well uh, this is p right so if i bring this volume over here then this becomes pv is equal to 1 by 3 nm v square like this now p if pv is this right then i can just in this pv i can write 1 by 3 nm v square like this right and this is equal to n r and clearly this gives me a relation uh, we know if i take this thing uh, uh, if so i well it, yeah yeah uh, what about the volume you didn't write that down oh uh, the volume we brought it over here right so uh, this we're writing this in terms of pa in the place of pressure times volume right oh, so okay, let okay, me yes yeah yes i got, you got it, it? you got it? okay good all right so yeah so now we just have to rearrange this equation a bit and we'll find uh an equation that we are really looking for right and the equation is uh, 3 by 2 kt that's kinetic energy right we want this equation uh, of course i should have not shown you this equation before we derived it um but i did anyways uh all right so we just have to rearrange this equation if i write this equation for one mole of gas right suppose that i want this equation for one mole now for one mole uh, of gas this equation if i rearrange this it becomes r times t divided by avogadro's number right and we would have this thing is equal to uh, let's see we have this thing rt uh, we have m and 1 by 3 and this thing right so we just rearranged this equation and we used uh, the fact that uh, n over n is avogadro's constant so is that clear this, uh, from this thing to this thing is understood yes okay good all right so we we can make another simplification and that simplification is uh, that the this let's define a constant let's i'll not name it yet and let's say that this r over n a is this thing well we know we can define this constant simply because of the fact that r is itself a constant it's also called the gas constant 
and Avogadro's number is also a constant. So you're just defining a new constant out of two other constants. And we can do that, that's allowed in mathematics. So this new constant was defined by Boltzmann and it's given a name Boltzmann constant, right? So using this new definition of Boltzmann constant, what I can do is I can rewrite this equation as, as what? This R over NA becomes K, right? And then we have T over here. And then this is equal to one by three M, this thing, velocity squared. So is that clear for everyone? Yes. Now, okay, good. So, uh, well, you can be, done by this point, we can make another, uh, uh, we can write this equation in another way by simply dividing this expression by two and taking three over there. And the reason we will do that is to make this equation look like the equation for kinetic energy, which is half mv squared. You can see that we have one by three m and v squared already over here. If instead of one by three, I had one by two m v squared, then this would be like a kinetic energy, right? It would have, it would be exactly like the kinetic energy for the translational motion. So what I'll do is I don't have more space on this page. So I'll just go to the next page and take this equation with me. So let's just do that. Copy and let's put it over here. So this is the equation that we have so far. And now what I can do with this thing is I can play around by just really dividing it by two. So I'll just say that I'm dividing this expression by two. And once I do that, this becomes KT by two is equal to two by three MV squared. Now it still is almost similar to half MV squared. Just take some things over there. So this becomes three, uh, by two kt is equal to half m v squared. Now this thing we already know is the kinetic energy. It 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 is it it is the kinetic energy of any particle half m v squared. If that's the kinetic energy and we have an equal to sign over here, then this thing is also a kinetic energy. And hence we deduce that the kinetic energy of one mole of gas uh, is given as three by two K T. Um, sir, how did that become half? Uh, which one? Um, half M and that V square. How did that become? Uh, oh, you, you mean this thing? Yes. Oh, uh, yeah, oh, j j just give me a second, I'll tell you. Uh, so basically uh, we have this thing, right? KT is equal to one by three M V squared, right? Now I want uh, two, one by two over here, right? So what I can do is first, let's just take this three over there. This becomes three KT. I kind of did this uh, directly. So I think that's why there is confusion. I'll do it over here. Uh, th this becomes three KT, right? And this is M v squared, something like this, right? Now you just divide this by two. So you, you get three kT, three by two kT is equal to m v squared and one by two. Uh, is this clear now? Yes. Yeah, okay, all right. So, okay. So this is the kinetic energy, which is three by two kT. Now this uh, is, the kinetic energy of a particle that is moving in any environment, right? And inter it's given in terms of temperature. Now you can clearly see from this equation that if I increase the temperature, of course, three by two and K is constant. So in physics, uh, when you're doing uh, f f physics normally, and not at your level, of course, but normally what we do is we, 
ignore all the constants. What we do is we set them all the constants that are going to always remain constants. We just set them equal to one, right? It's not equal to, but it's like, you just say that they're one. And at the end of this thing, you all, you put them back in the equations. Uh, because constants are not telling you anything about the physics of the situation. So if I ignore three by two and K, then I can see that kinetic energy is proportional to temperature, which means that as I increase the temperature, which we'll discuss how we can do that, uh, you will increase the kinetic energy of the particle, right? So the relation that we were looking for is this one. All right, so is there any question up until this point from anyone? No, sir. No questions? Okay. All right, so uh, I have a question uh, for all of you, by the way. Uh, you, you all, all of you gave the quiz, right? Everyone gave the quiz within the class right now? Yes. Yes. All right. So, so how how was the quiz? How how did it go? In, did, were you able to complete it in time, uh, or did you find that the, there is less time and uh, there were more questions? Any anything of that sort? Just uh, give me a general uh, feedback uh, on the quiz. That would be appreciated. Uh, the time limit was fine. Time limit was fine. Okay. And so, uh, how about the questions? Uh, were you uh, were you able to solve the questions uh, having the knowledge that you gained from these classes? Were the questions uh, yes. uh, so you were satisfied with? Um, uh, when you saw the quiz, you were okay that, yes, we did, we, we understood, we talked about these things in the class as well. Uh, was it like this or was it more like, uh, you know how it is, right? Uh, well, the teacher never taught this to us and he gave us things out of syllabus, or was it like that? No, it was, it was uh, from the syllabus, of course. Yeah, of course, there are some things which are they're still in the syllabus, but the the things are given to you so that uh, you know it. You have to they allow you to work on your thinking skills as well. So that's also uh, the motive behind it, really. So of course, uh, we'll be discussing your quizzes uh, very soon, uh, hopefully by the end of this week, and you might uh, you. I, I don't want to give you any surprise quizzes, so I will not do that. Um, so just be prepared uh, in this week, by the end of this week, there will be another quiz on the very first chapter, Circular Motion. And if you were to, if you were able to solve the quiz from gravitational uh, fields, uh, you'll be able to solve the circular motion. It's quite easy, uh, nothing uh, hard of that sort. Um, so, so uh, tomorrow? Yeah. Uh, not tomorrow. Um, I'll just say it, it, it will be on Friday, right? So I was going, going to tell you on after the class, uh, finalize it and everything, but most probably it will be on Friday, right? Oh. Yeah, so I, I'll communicate it in the uh, gr group as well. Uh, the, the, the topic or the chapter is uh, circular motion. It was the very first chapter. So if you have any questions regarding anything from circular motion, uh, you can, th there is tomorrow. Uh, so you can, uh, tomorrow is Thursday, right? So you can ask your questions tomorrow as well, if you're preparing today. All right. So, okay. So with that out of the way, uh, we can, now we have also derived this relation between kinetic energy and temperature. Uh, we've been using the word temperature a lot. Uh, let's see what this thing really is. What is temperature, right? So let's move our discussion to the topic of what is temperature. Right, so we know that if I have a body and let's suppose, um, 
we we all uh, are you all familiar with this fact that temperature is a field uh, or are you hearing this thing for the first time okay so i'll just explain uh, the concept of fields as well to explain temperature uh, in mathematics a field is defined as a set of operations so it could be plus minus multiplication and division this set of operations is done on real numbers and they'll give you uh, a real number right so it's just something it's just like a scalar right so you can do uh, what this weird looking thing means is if i have two and i want i can do some operations on it those operations are plus so for example i want to add another uh, number to this i can do two plus one and this these both are real numbers so two is a real number one is a real number adding these two numbers will give me three three is also a real number so it belongs to this real field right so this gives me three which is again a real number so what is happening is that when if you take a, any real number and you do these operations on those real numbers you come back to a real number now this real number is a real numbers field now in this is how we also define scalars right uh, so you might have heard uh, a very um, what do you say uh, boring definition of scalars and that's that they are just numbers and they don't they have a magnitude but no direction and i think that that is the most boring uh, explanation that you can hear for scalars and then there is also for vectors that they have direction and magnitude uh, both and that's also a boring explanation but of course you don't have to go into the exotic uh, descriptions of scalars and vectors so uh, but here is just a touch of uh, the interesting definitions of scalars really so this is how you also define scalar right now temperature is a scalar field so it's a field in a room for example this is a room and in this room you can there exists this field at every point in this room you can think of field as a fluid like substance that is spread all across this room right so at every point in this room you can assign a number and you can say that this number measures how cold or hot is the room right so that's what temperature is so at every point in this room you can assign a number to this point right so i'm drawing multiple points so suppose that here we have multiple points now suppose in this room there is a fire at one part of the room so suppose that there is a fireplace over here right and in this corner of the room there is a window now of course near the window all the points that are near this window the temperature would be low the values what i mean is the values at these points that i'm assigning the numbers would be smaller compared to if i uh, if i look at these points that are closer to this fireplace there these numbers would be high and then i once i check this I, i'm defining temperature in this way i'm saying where i have these numbers higher that's where i say it's hot right so it's just an, a word of english you just assign you just say yes that this is hot so that's what hot means and cold is where this value is small this number is small that's what you call uh, cold so that's what temperature is so uh is there any question by the way from uh, what i've been telling you or did you just get lost in all of this is it making sense okay yes okay right okay so the take away from this uh, thing is that temperature is a field it's really a scalar field and it is 
you can think of it as a fluid-like substance. So let me just write this, uh, all of these over here. So it's a field. Temperature is a field. It's a scalar field. And you can think of it, this field, as a fluid-like substance. And it's spread all over the room. Spread all, actually spread all over space, right? So, and these are just numbers. And the higher the number, uh, higher numbers, so I'll just say numbers that are high, meaning this arrow pointing upward means high, uh, corresponds to uh, hot, hotness. And this number being small corresponds to coldness. That's how you define temperature. Uh, of course, then you can go into its philosophies and you can make more definitions and descriptions out of this thing. But this is really the most basic way you can define temperature. Right, so now suppose we have been talking in terms of just one body, right? This is just one body. Uh, suppose that we have two different bodies. Suppose that you have, uh, suppose this is body A and this is body B. All right, now, uh, what happens is, suppose that this body A is at some temperature T1 and this body B is at some temperature T2. Now, at this point, these bodies are separate from each other. What would happen, what would you, you think would happen if I were to bring these bodies so close that they uh, are, they touch each other. So suppose they are like this now. So this is A and this is B. What would happen to temperature of this entire system compared to the temperatures of these individual systems? Uh, what would you think would happen? Or what should happen? Anyone? Um, the, the one with the higher temperature will cause the, the one with the lower one to have a greater temperature. Uh, right, exactly. Right. So that's, uh, that's very good because, uh, and that happens. Why? Because 